morning or a good afternoon or evening or whatever time you're choosing to listen to this podcast. You can't really time stamp or date a podcast as to when people are listening. So I ruined the whole thing already straight out of the gate with the intro. Um, it's morning for me. It's afternoon for my two co-hosts. My name is Tyler Mon. I'm in Denver, Colorado, 1044 a.m. on this Wednesday, August 16th, 2023. How's that for not time stamping something? Joining me from New York City are Benjamin Hill and fresh off a trip to Dan Flashes, it's Samuel P. Dykstra. Um, hi, Sam. That might be hi, the closest ben. I've ever gotten to actually cursing on the show. <laughs> I almost just like cursed you out for that. And then I realized we we're there's a hot mic situation here and we don't need that out in the water. Listen, man, I got this fair, shirt. I like, I like that shirt. I got this shirt basically specifically for spring training. Okay. Uh, I was, was walking like around a vintage store. $800 because the fabric, the patterns are so complicated. Yeah, that's that's exactly what it is. It's got some like, you know, some pink flowers on it, some orange flowers on it. You know what it makes me think of? It makes me think of uh, of flies, fly fishing flies. That's what it makes oh, me think okay. of. And I like sure. it. I like it for that. I yeah, I can, cool. I can definitely see that. Ben's more classic today. Ben's in like a maroon and gray checkered uh flannel i don't know if it's actually a flannel but i feel like anything with that pattern we just automatically call flannels now in society is that right yeah it's not it could be flannel but it's not it's just a yeah just maroon, a, cotton, a breathable it's a classic ben's biz shirt if you've seen pictures of me on the road or met me on the road there's basically like a 30 percent chance i was wearing this shirt that day I, i'm a pretty predictable in my wardrobe and i wear shirts until they can't be worn no more I don't look at a shirt and say, oh, it's out of style now. I'm like, if I fit into it and it's not stained or missing buttons, then it's good to go. You have to join Sam on his next trip to the shops at the creek. Uh, <laughs> anybody who has never watched I Think You Should Leave is like, what are these idiots talking about? Um, and now it's there's your recommendation to uh, to go take up the rest of your morning slash afternoon slash evening or whenever you're listening to this. Uh, as we welcome you into the latest episode of the show before the show podcast, the official podcast of minor league baseball. A lot to talk about this week uh, as we hit really about a month and a half left on the minor league calendar on field in 2023. We are basically exactly a month and a half away from the AAA championship game, um, which is sort of wild. Uh, but uh, gents, it's uh, it's been a loaded couple of weeks since the trade deadline and uh, the MLB all-star break and everything else have elapsed and wrapped up. Yeah, I mean, Ben and I have talked about this a lot because it's Ben's specialty word, but we're getting emails into our inboxes now about the penultimate homestands yeah it is pen penultimate homestand season which is always a little uh i don't quite say disturbing but um unsettling that we're like wait what <laughs> we're already the swift uh... shifting sands of time yeah yeah like yeah, how is that enunciation there tyler Thank that, was, you. that was very impressive that's the only um, way i'm gonna get through uh you know that many confusing words in a row but yeah that's uh i had to very actively think about it but that really is true that we get down to the to the last few weeks and it's like what how is this possible already it was just opening day well, not only that, but just the way minor league baseball works now with the six game series. I mean, it used to be the penultimate series could happen in the last week um, because you would be facing multiple opponents in one week. Now it's just one six game series all week. Um, so you're going to get these. It's going to feel early, not earlier and earlier, but it's going to feel early for a while until we really settle into this. Now we're in season three, like we should be kind of used to it by now, but still taking some getting used to. But yeah, we're around that time now. I mean. The AAA National Championship, I think, is six weeks away as we sit here in mid-August. So we're, we're already looking at postseason. We're already looking at playoff uh, elimination numbers and all that for the second half. And, uh, yeah, it's about that time. And uh, in addition to on-field stuff, we've also had some other cool events that have uh, steamrolled their way through minor league ballparks and will continue to do so. I was uh, lucky enough to be part of one of those last week. Yeah, you were in Hartford, as you guys talked about on the pod, when you were in a minor league city and Ben was in a major league city. Um, but yeah, you were in Hartford for Home Run Derby X. What was that experience like? And you're that's not your only one. You're going from Hartford, well, you're back in Denver now, but then you're going to be going to Fredericksburg uh, to catch another Home Run Derby X event. Next week, uh, the home of the Fredericksburg Nationals, the uh, second Home Run Derby X event to be held in the United States will take place uh, coming up. In Virginia. But yeah, last week, um, got a chance to, to head to Hartford to Duncan Park, no longer Duncan Donuts Park. Uh, although the first time that I said the name of the ballpark with uh, Hartford Yard Goats broadcaster Jeff Dooley on our call of Home Run Derby X, I definitely said Duncan Donuts Park. Um, but man, it was great. First off, uh, shout out to the fans in Hartford because Home Run Derby X 
uh, an event that had only been held internationally until last week. Uh, you know, fans had never really gotten to see it in person, didn't really know what it was about. That did not matter in Hartford. They sold out uh, 6,000 plus tickets within a week. Um, those fans were amazing. They were so much fun uh, to have in the ballpark and to be engaged with Home Run Derby X and all that. And a secondary shout out to the Hartford Yard Goats front office uh, from Tim Rextall and Mike Abramson and uh, Jeff Dooley and everybody else on down. Um, there is no better franchise in minor league baseball deserving of the honor of hosting the first Home Run Derby X in the U.S. Uh, and they they crushed it. They uh, They did everything exactly as you would dream up for an event like that. And it was cool. We had Four teams. It was a different setup than what we had in London or what they did last year in, in London and Seoul and Mexico City. Uh, four teams, each led by a former big leaguer. So, of course, Nick Swisher uh, was part of it, as was Johnny Gomes. Those two guys are home run derby X stalwarts. Um, Dexter Fowler, who uh, won a World Series with the Cubs and won home run derby X in London. Uh, he was joined out there by his former Cubs teammate, Jake Arrieta. So those two guys uh, had their own teams. Jake Arrieta's team actually won, which was pretty amazing. You go into it and you think like, ah, the team with a, a pitcher, probably not going to do that well in a home run. Der-. Jake Arrieta was hitting baseballs uh, in the, the, Home run derby uh, hitting platform was set up essentially in the middle of the infield between first and second base, and everybody was hitting toward the left field seats. Uh, Jake Arietta was hitting balls off of the top of the video board in left field, which for anybody who has been to to Duncan Park in Hartford, uh, even from the middle of the infield, that is nothing cheap. And uh, so it was pretty cool to see a guy who, you know, was known for winning a Cy Young and winning a World Series on the mound uh, also decimate baseballs um, while hitting in a in a home run derby setting. But it was great. The uh, the teams this year uh, for this event were uh, comprised of the former major leaguers and also local players. There were over 250, I believe, um, people who responded to try to be part of Home Run Derby X, you know, former minor leaguers, uh, indie ball players, college baseball players, college softball players. Um, and those players were whittled down to a group of about 60 uh, that came out for the the tryout day, which was on Thursday of last week. Later that day, uh, the four MLB players went into a draft room. They picked two hitters that would be part of their team for the next day. Uh, so it gave it this very like national slash local feel, which was really cool. Um, but it was great. And uh, again, just a shout out to the yard goats who did uh, everything as perfectly as you could possibly dream up for an event like that. And it was a lot of fun. Uh, and Fredericksburg next week, we're coming your way, Fred Nats. Um, that's going to be really cool. I'm really excited to see uh, what the ballpark is like in Fredericksburg. Um, it's it's a, a place that I have long wanted to see, uh, having gone through the old home of that team back when they were the Potomac Nationals. Uh, I know how long they were eagerly anticipating a new park, and so really excited for that. And um, yeah, coming up uh, to Fredericksburg next week, we will be uh, in town uh, for that event. It, the event itself will be on the 26th, um, and we are super excited for that one. Yeah, and in Hartford... They gave away uh, Bouncing Pickles bobbleheads, I believe. Bouncing Pickles being one, one of their alternate identities from earlier this year. So you talk about, you know, the Yard Goat staff doing a good job and the fans really showing up. I mean, I think just like with an all-star game or sometimes playoff games, when you have these special events, you've got to create, uh, you know, incentives to get people to to show up a little bit. So bouncing pickle bobblehead that's yeah uh, that was, it was very cool people were lined up way early it was the first thousand fans through the gates got a bouncing pickles bobblehead um and the one of the neatest elements uh that i thought um was included in the the yard goats version of home run derby x you know in in london we did it as there was a, a yankees team and there was a red sox team and there was a cubs team and you know those types of things and a cardinals team obviously those were the the two the cubs and cardinals who were playing in london um but uh in hartford the teams that were represented were the schoolboys the steam cheeseburgers the chivos and the bouncing pickles. So four of the yard goats alternate identities. Uh the schoolboys identity was Jake Arietta's, so that team won. But I thought that was such an awesome way to tie things in uh and make it I think feel probably more um compelling to local fans. I mean if fans come in and you know there are big league former big league players and guys representing big league teams. That's cool. But when you have the guys wearing your hometown teams, alternate jerseys and hats, I think that feels very cool. Um, so yeah, looking forward to, to seeing what the Fredericksburg event is going to be like. And uh, that's coming up on August 26th. So get your tickets now. Still some available uh, for home run derby X 
in Fredericksburg on August 26th uh, at the home of the Fred Nats and uh, the second home run derby X event ever to take place in the United States. And hopefully your play-by-play guy, uh, me, will not be uh, too annoying over the loudspeakers in your ballpark because that was a whole different experience. But a big thanks to Jeff Dooley, by the way, uh, for joining me on the uh, the Home Run Derby X call in Hartford because he is a class act, a guy who made his big league debut earlier this year, filling in on uh, some Rockies radio broadcasts, um, just a, an awesome guy and uh, in a minor league uh, legend in his own right. So um, check out uh, MILB.com slash Fredericksburg, and you can find your seats for Home Run Derby X coming up on the 26th. And um, speaking of trips, through sort of that mid-Atlantic region. Uh, Ben, last week we uh, caught up about uh, scranton Wilkesbury, one of your stops on the road a couple of weeks ago. And this week uh, we are going to dive into some of your uh, journeying through Lehigh Valley, which is one of the most jam-packed minor league locales with, uh, you know, always innovative promos and alternate identities and everything else. Uh, You've been to Lehigh Valley. Uh, When was the last time actually that you had been there before this year? Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. It's always good to clear your throat before speaking. Um, yeah, I was last there five years ago, so it would have been not a ton of time by my standards, but uh, always good to get there again. And um, I love the Lehigh Valley region in general, you know, having grown up, as I've s- spoken of many times in the past, you know, grown up not too far from there. And it's not a very long drive from Scranton. So, um, you know, of course, it was like, why not? This was in Scranton. Now time to go to Lehigh Valley. Um, they play in Allentown which I believe is the biggest city in the Lehigh Valley. I really like Allentown. It's um, definitely scrappy, rough around the edges, but I just there's such a distinct sense of place in there with the industrial past and um, interesting architecture and and um, kind of a small city feel with a really diverse population. Every time I'm there, I want to explore more um, and, and be there more than I am. There is a fantastic record store in Allentown called Double Decker, and I got there – uh, to Allentown in time to go to Double Decker before I went to Coca-Cola Park, home of the Lehigh Valley Iron Pigs. And that is one of the best record stores that I've ever been to. I had been there a couple times in the past, but man, this kind of, uh, you know, it's not the best location. It's kind of a, uh, the, the building itself's a little run down. It doesn't really have much aesthetic charm, but man, what a great place. And I think uh, in a way that speaks for Allentown that, you know, if you just kind of did the proverbial flyover or drive through, you'd be like, Oh, I don't know about this place. But then you start poking around and there's uh, a lot of interesting things uh, throughout that city. And if you like records and you're going to Lehigh Valley iron pigs, check out double decker. I spent way too much money uh, at that place. I was like, Oh, I got too many records, but um, I'll stop in just to see what they have. And almost right away, I was like, "Uh Oh, <laughs> like it's going to be one of those afternoons. And fortunately I only had about an hour to spare. Cause who knows? Uh, how much more over the top it would have gotten. But yeah, then I went to um, Coca-Cola Park and uh, always good to be there. You know, that team debuted in 2008, the Iron Pigs, and have been just basically one of the you know premier franchises in the minor leagues ever since then. Um, you know, really great fan base, you know, being not far from Philadelphia and a triple A Phillies affiliate, uh, really good front office staff. I don't know the exact numbers, but they basically, they must lead the league in alternate identities for sure. There's always something uh, going on promotionally there. You know, ballpark just with like a lot of room to move all throughout the concourse. You know, quirky, interesting signage, big video board, ribbon boards, tons of food options to the to where the pigs, the iron pigs are one of the only teams I know that have a standalone separate food related site, pigsfoodfinder.com. So there is a, a lot to explore there. I was there on Scrapple Night, you know, so the paying tribute to Scrapple, which we've talked about in the past that, uh, Beloved meat mush, mush of uh, Pennsylvania. I think in the, in Pennsylvania it goes back to uh, you know the Pennsylvania Dutch heritage, and uh, Delmarva Shorebirds in Maryland have also done some scrapple themed stuff. But my designated either eater, Jonathan Armstrong, he got a, a scrapple sandwich at the ballpark, which you don't get to see very often. They have a gluten free stand, so towards the end of the game when the stand was still open, I was like, you know what, I got some time. I'm going to get my own meal. And uh, I got something that I'd also highlighted earlier in the night with my designated eater that happens to be gluten free, uh, the pork parfait. But it's just like a, uh, you know, kind of a, a plastic container, but somewhat similar to what you'd imagine an ice cream sundae would be in. And it's just layers of, you know, slow cor- slow cooked pork and uh, mashed potatoes um, in a large 
cup <laughs> and uh it was uh pretty tasty another big thing there is the uh, all shucks corn they have a standalone corn stand you know um roasted fresh right there and uh you know then top of butter different spices cheeses uh another great element there um but yeah just a really fun place to see a game uh, good to see some people on staff that i hadn't seen for a little while um got a few interesting interviews there and uh those will be coming up um on MILB.com in the near future. And, uh, you know, a good way to close off the trip. I drove straight home that night back to Brooklyn and was home around uh, a little before one in the morning. So what a day. Wake up in Scranton, drive to Lehigh Valley, hit a killer record store, go to an Iron Pigs game, and sleep in my own bed at night. I'm living the dream. I can't think of a better Ben's Biz day, <laughs> yeah. honestly. The fact that it involves Pennsylvania, record stores, your own bed in Brooklyn, and a uh, pork parfait. And a pork parfait. I mean, come on. <laughs> yeah. that, that's a dream. I don't think even you knew you had when that started. Um, yeah. W- w- when you look back at like what it was like going to Lehigh Valley games as a kid, what's changed? Well, I didn't go to Lehigh Valley games as a kid because they didn't come around until oh, uh, right. okay. 2008. When you were younger. It was right. Scranton that I went to. Um, Relatively. A kid. As, as, yeah. Well, a young Ben's biz. Yeah. Young. Like, yeah. young it was young In Ben's the biz. nascent sure. era of Ben's biz. It was very much. I, I think the first time I ever went there was in my early days of Ben's Biz, seeing the um the Triple A All Star Game when they hosted that in two thousand nine to now two thousand ten. I want to say, um, and I know they've made improvements to the stadium, and there's new signs and you know additions to the video board and ribbon boards, but the play it's always seemed kind of fundamentally the same to me in a good way since it opened and just really well maintained and always just such an energy there. Um, I'm sure like any team in, you know, a cold Tuesday night in April, there's not a big crowd, but this is a place where people, you know, really turn out and always have uh, turned out. So that's, that's always been a great thing to see. And um, yeah, for me, the iron pigs kind of coincide with my professional career Um, in terms of right around the time I became full time was when they became a team. So I look at the the two of us traveling together in tandem as we established our operation and then tried to maintain a level of quality and excellence throughout into our middle age and beyond. That was so imposing at the end into our middle age and beyond. Um, Ben, what's coming up next? What, uh, as you wrap up one road trip and set sights, I know you had uh, a road trip that has been um, Edison. Yes. Jettison, I like that word. Um, what's coming up next? You have uh, anything between now and the end of this uh, rapidly dwindling 2023 season? I do in September. I believe the dates are September 5th through the 10th. And uh, we can get into the specifics of that um, maybe next week, just because uh, I don't have the exact itinerary in front of me. And I want to keep people waiting. I want people to be listening to this and saying, where is Ben's biz going to go? Is the great one going to visit my town? Shall I see him wandering on, on the concourse? On pins and needles. <laughs> yeah. Um, but no, I'm getting out there one more time and that's great. But in the meantime, I feel like I have at least one article I will or can write from all of my trips <laughs> so far. I know I have at least one more I can go back to all the way to the dating back to my Pacific Northwest trip in May. Um, just did a story um, from this most recent trip that went up on MILB.com uh, this week on Richard Tylicki. Uh He's the Binghamton Rumble Ponies Director of Operations, and uh, he's been working with the team since 1995, you know, back when they were the Binghamton Mets, but they've always been a double-A Eastern League Mets affiliate. But throughout almost the entirety of his time with the Rumble Ponies, dating back to 1995, he also served in the Pennsylvania National Guard so an interesting minor league career in that he always had his National Guard service obligations as well as five deployments throughout that time. And uh, one of the deployments was nine months. The other four were for a year. And one of those four was was uh, preceded by a whole year of preparation for the deployment. So you're talking overall something like six years um, in his stint working for the Rumble Ponies in which he was not working for them. He was serving um, – you know, serving the country as an Army National Guard member. So it was interesting to talk to him and, uh, you know, how supportive the team had been through multiple ownership groups and, you know, in, in dealing with that schedule. There are acts of legislation that, you know, protect the employment of, you know, service members such as Richard and that, you know, that have some job guarantee. But he always said that 
you know, the team was welcoming and went above and beyond. And, and then just talking about that sort of disconnect of, you know, what's important when you're working in a minor league ballpark and then what's important when you're in Kuwait or wherever you may be on a deployment, you know, you have just different, uh, different priorities, but he also made a lot of parallels too, just in terms of, um, you know, being in the military and working in minor league baseball and there's a mix of inside and outside a diverse array of job duties, having to think on your feet, um, working long hours. Um, and I think he saw a lot of parallels too, that I think each one fed into the other. So an interesting guy and, you know, another Ben's biz story for all to enjoy, hopefully. And uh, I got a lot more where that's coming from at least one more uh, coming up later this week and another one next week. And then I'll be on a little vacation next week. Uh, and then after that, we'll yeah, get in my next trip and still have road material and anything else coming from, uh, from all angles. And, you know, we'll, we'll pass the penultimate homestand and beyond and, Cruise right into the off season, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. Let's live in the present moment because all we ever have ever is the present moment. And uh, let's savor it. Those are my favorite. Uh, the The existential Ben's biz lines are my favorite lines. Um, well, and we are going to get to go into a, a present moment that you savored at the time and now get to savor in retrospect with our conversation in today's episode of the show before the show. Yes. We can do that. Thank you. Um, <laughs> before uh, I was in Lehigh Valley, as I mentioned before, I was uh, in Music PA, home of the Scranton Wilkesbury Rail Riders. And when I was there, before the game, I spoke with Adam Marco, a guy who you know, you guys know, uh, you know, through the years. He's been, um, you know, longtime uh, broadcaster in the minor leagues, first with the West Virginia Power. Um, and then now with the AAA Yankees affiliate, the Rail Riders. And um, I always enjoy seeing Adam and talking to him. But the reason I uh, did this interview with Adam Marco is because pretty much through the entirety of the time I've known him, going well back into his days with the West Virginia Power, um, he has gone out of his way to document the restaurants and um, you know tourist attractions of the city of, of what he experiences on the road. In the with the West Virginia Power that was in the South Atlantic League, and now of course um, with the Rail Riders that's in the International League, and uh, he used to have a blog called Minor League Kerouac where he documented all these things. Now it's mostly on Twitter, but as you will hear in this interview, um, he has gone out of his way to explore all the minor league cities he gets to visit. He's basically an expert on all of them. If you need food recommendations for international league and Southern league city, South, uh, South Atlantic league cities, talk to Adam Marco and uh, you'll hear a lot of them here in this interview. Adam Marco broadcaster for the Scranton Wilkesbury rail riders and a minor league Kerouac. I'm here with Adam Marco by play man broadcaster for the Scranton Wilkesbury Rail Riders. First of all, I know there's a lot of debate on this. What do you say, Wilkes? Wilkes Scranton Wilkesbury. Barry. You say, yes. you say Barry as well. Yes, there's Wilkesbury, Wilkes Bear, and yeah. Wilkes Bar. Right. I think it really depends on where you grew up mm -hmm. in this region. Or if you moved here, the first person you talked to. <laughs> yeah, I think that's what it was for me coming here as a kid. I just always said Barry. Uh, so you say Barry. We're going to go with Barry. I'm good with that. Uh, from here on out. But we're now not... I'm second guessing it. Thank <laughs> yeah, you. Yeah, thank yeah. You. I am too. Um, but we're not here to talk about pronunciation. Um, you've been a minor league broadcaster for a good amount of time. This is your what number season in? 16th year. I uh, started in, well... Whatever 2020 was, there's that. Yeah. I started in 2007 with the Williamsport Crosscutters. Mm -hmm. I was a promo intern. Didn't know if I was going to have the chance to do broadcasts. They ended up signing a radio deal, so we did our road games on the radio and the home games at Historic Bowman Field. I was running the Dixon Dip or the Press Box, if, <laughs> if that's what I needed to do. But I got my start in 07 with Williamsport. A couple years in Oklahoma City. A lengthy run with the West Virginia Power down in Charleston, and then had the chance to come here to Scranton Wilkesbury in 2018. Yeah, and we first crossed paths in uh, with the West Virginia Power. Uh, I recall a Mick Foley, yeah, uh, sing off something along those yeah, lines. I had a karaoke battle with yeah. Mick Foley yeah. on the on the dugout. Um, but one thing I liked that you were doing back in those days, and that you're still doing in some form right now on social media, 
was it the minor league Kerouac? Kerouac. Yeah. You, you were the Jack Kerouac on the road of uh, minor league baseball. But similar to what I like to highlight, um, you know, you really like to, within as your schedule allows, explore the cities and particularly the restaurants. And since now we're here in the International League, a massive circuit these days. A Very true. Gargantuan circuit. Um, I see you on Twitter highlighting favorite restaurants, favorite places. So, not to put you on the spot, but I know, you, of course, you love Scranton, Wilkes, Barry. Um, but in terms of when you're traveling, uh, what is the best International League city in terms of like, oh, I have a little bit of time in the morning before a game or at night to explore in terms of bars, restaurants, cultural attractions? So part of this stemmed from I wanted to, you can read the game story. You can read the recap. So the blog a decade ago started out like, here's what else happened on the trip. Yes. And it really got me into like, what am I doing in these towns, these cities that we go to? So what can I experience? What's the cuisine? And that's really what it stemmed from first and foremost. So the International League has some great spots. I, Amy Venuto years ago told me, it's more than just the food. Tell us what else is going on. So yes. when I was in Norfolk, I did the naval tour mm-hmm. and I took a two hour boat tour of the ports and the docks and that was amazing and you never put so much perspective behind it i started out using like TripAdvisor. i tried to find the best restaurants i would ask people you know what's the most popular thing in this town what's the most popular restaurant and then when i get to a place i'll ask what's the most popular dish what's the number one thing people order and i might have something on the menu that i want but i'll have like two things in mind and if they say if I have shrimp and grits in my head and they say, oh, you have to try the shrimp and grits, done. I'll do it. Mm -hmm. So I have a place or two in every city that I really love. I will go out of my way to try. Uh, I don't know if I can pinpoint a particular one. This past trip, uh, I gave a 10 out of 10 to Duff's Wings in Buffalo. It's in Amherst. It's about 20 minutes away from downtown Buffalo. Perfect sauce, shoestring fries, a 10 of 10 on my scale is rare. Mm-hmm. Uh, also, the scale is made up. <laughs> so, you know, it's a 8.01 at mm-hmm. Bar Bill. Why is it point one? I have no earthly idea. It's very much whose line is it anyway, point style. Yeah. But it does reflect my thoughts. So, like, I've been a fan of Duff's in Buffalo since we started going there, since I started going there in 2018. Saltine in Norfolk, Virginia is one of my favorite places. A couple of years ago, when I started driving down to Allentown, going to Lehigh Valley, there's Yule's Oyster House. I'm a huge fan of oysters. I'll get them wherever I can. And it's another like 15, 20 minute drive. I started to drive to some of these places. It saves on Uber, makes up for it in gas, I'm sure. But I don't want to be just limited to what I can walk to. Uh, And if need be, I will scooter wherever I can. (laughs) Norfolk is a great place for that. Charlotte was a great place for the scooter tours. So there are a few places off the top of my head just in, in recent trips for this team. But I've found a spot pretty much in every city. Like if I go to Toledo, you have to go across the bay to the other side of that little waterfront, and there's a great set of restaurants there. Indianapolis has a couple of really fun places. Louisville. There's some places that I hope the schedule makers let us go. Mm-hmm. I'd love to get to Memphis. I'd love to get to Nashville. And I've been there for the winter meetings or for baseball trips in years past, but I'd love to get back there, Jacksonville, and try some new spots. We're kind of the old International League North, so I have my places like the Worcester Public Market. If you're up in that direction, Mm -hmm. get Accra African Fusion. It's tremendous. Right next to it in the Public Market is the Momo Palace, uh, the dumplings. I, I mean, this is a lot of food. It's what I do. But... I can't just sit in the hotel. Yeah. So whether it's going to find the best golf course, if I have the time in my day, usually at the end of the week, or taking a historic tour, you know, there's a trail down in Charlotte uh, in Norfolk that have separate walking trails and where you can go and like, experience the history of those regions, of those cities. That's a big part of what I like to do as well. I, I find that interesting, and I think the listeners, it resonates with them hearing not just about what's happening innings one through nine, but the rest of the day. Right, so this is not just a personal pursuit for your own selfish ends. It is No, it's mostly that. But, <laughs> yes, there, there, it's research as well. It's, I, I've had fans stop me recently and say, you know, really appreciated hearing about that 
naval tour in Norfolk, and you don't really recognize the size of these battleships until you're up against one, and then you see the next one. You see an aircraft carrier, and you're like, well, that other one's very small. Uh, so it, it really helps me on the broadcast side. It, it helps pass the time in some of these cities, and I think for the fans that listen on the radio that don't make the trip to these spots, you have the ability to learn, you know, what is that region known for? What's that region about? And in your uh, West Virginia Power Days, you had a blog documenting a lot of this. As we were talking before I started the interview, blogs are not so much a thing right now for reasons that sometimes are a little unclear. It's a great format. Right. But um, so now on Twitter, or X as I guess it's uh, technically called, I know that you do some documentation there. Do you document this in other places or is your ranking system all on a spreadsheet? I mean, how methodical are you about the places you've been and and where do you put this information? uh, It is predominantly on X, Twitter, whatever you would like to call it at this point in time. Uh, There have been thoughts in my head about doing different versions of this over the last couple of years. But for the time being, this is predominantly where it lives. Uh, but it also, it, it lives in our broadcast because mm-hmm. everything that happens during that day or nearly everything, a story is told that night because I want you to understand what that area is known for, what the most famous cuisine is. When I was in the South Atlantic League, I did a tour of like, what are the best sandwich places mm-hmm. across the entire South Atlantic League? It was Zunzi's in Savannah, Georgia. Mm-hmm. What was the best barbecue? which was Willie's locally known in Lexington, Kentucky, which I don't think is open anymore. Uh, So I had at one point like a yearly cuisine and then I just got burned out of like, I I can't do barbecue anymore. Mm -hmm. So now I really want to know what each city is known for. Um, You know, after, well, beginning in 2021, after the reorganization of minor league baseball, you know, the six game series became a regular thing is has that helped you in terms of the exploration and that you can really settle in or hunker down or do you wish you kind of were able to bounce around a little bit more i would be one to say i'd like to see us bounce around a little bit more i understand the player development side the player side that Mm -hmm. it's tough on a normal person Mm -hmm. (laughs) let alone these athletes that are you know traveling and hoping to put in a good effort tonight and again tomorrow and the next day I would love to see some more variation, but I understand entirely. Um, that's a split answer, I think. That's the democratic answer to it. But you know, I'd love a day where we have a three-game series and then we have another three-game series on a six-game trip. Like keep that aspect of it, and you know, we go to Buffalo, Rochester, which are an hour and a half apart, or something like that. That's easy for us. It's not easily done in every other spot in this country, and I understand that. I think I settle in. I think there are some places like Worcester, where I'll go to the public market a few times, Mm -hmm. uh, experience one restaurant that I like there, then go to a different stand, probably pick up dessert there every single day. Don't pass that up at any point in time either. Um, There are some spots where after a while you're just ready to go home. You feel like you've been there a month and it's Mm -hmm. been three and a half days. (laughs) The weather has a lot to do with that in all of these stops as well. But... uh, I, I wouldn't mind going back to a different setup, but I understand what it is and try to make the best of of what you've got in each of these cities. And uh, tonight we're speaking before a Rochester, a Scranton Wilkesbury Rail Riders versus Rochester Red Wings game Thursday, August 3rd. So Rochester Red Wings. Um, if one was to go to Rochester, one of 17 Rochesters uh, in the country, <laughs> as a reader pointed out to me when I, d- I failed to identify what state was in, and they said, hey, there's 17 Rochesters. We're talking Rochester, New York. Right. Um, do you have any favorites in Rochester, New York? Well, the thing you have to do in Rochester is the garbage plate. Yeah, Nick Tahoe's. They are, they are known for that. I'm a Stevie T's guy. Mm-hmm. It's a little bit of drive, but you know what? That's fine, too. Uh, Nick Tahoe's the original. I've had that. I've had Stevie T's. Uh, so that is like the staple. That's what you have to say. There's a restaurant downtown called Branca. There's a newer one that I've gone to the last couple of trips, Native, also in the downtown area. Uh, both very good. Uh, those two stand out atop the list. But, you know, each city is known for something. And you have to convince somebody, I think, to get a garbage plate. Yeah. You have to explain to them what it is. And then at least you, know, you got to try it one time. I understand that. I've been trying to convince people for years. 
it's it's a once a year rite of passage, I think, for internationally broadcasters, at least for myself to do, and then force upon somebody else to go with me. Yeah, and, and speaking of forcing someone else to go with you, I mean, often being a broadcaster can be well, you're with, you're traveling with a team, but it's, it can be a solitary life in a lot of ways. Do you go to a lot of these places alone, or do you have regular traveling companions? How does it work socially? We've been very fortunate since I got here and even predecessors prior to John Sadak and Derek Hedrick would travel together. So over the years, my number two broadcaster, Adam Giardino for two seasons, Joe Vasile and I barely traveled in 2021, Steve Granato last year. And this year I've got Emily Messina on the broadcast with me. Travel to most, if not every road game, couple of the longer trips that we don't send to. So I've got a built-in best friend with me no matter where I go. There's some days where you, know, you spend so much time around each other and then the broadcast, like I'll go one direction and this year Emily will go another. But you know, new to the International League, she trusts my judgment and my experiences and my rating scale for some reason as to <laughs> where we should go and what we should try. And I don't think I've led anybody astray over the years. And I'm open to suggestions. I always want to see... You know, new places to try, places to go. Uh, Trey Wilson down in the Eastern League with Richmond put it out on Twitter a few years ago. Hey, what are some Eastern League spots I should try? Trey's an expert in the Eastern League. He is. And I I chimed in on one of his. Uh, yeah. So it's, it's always fun to get new recommendations. I'm always going to have a few favorites. And the people that make the trip with me over the course of these last couple of years, we always have a good time doing it and experiencing New moments, new food, uh, new sights in whatever city we're in. And I guess finally, do you have any white whales, so to speak, places that you've heard about that you want to go to that for reasons of transportation, the hours that are open, reservations, whatever the case may be that you keep wanting to get to but you haven't been to yet? The answer is no. Um, If only because I make plans... I plan ahead of time. I chart out the week sometimes, like when we were in Buffalo. And Buffalo's not, you know, there's there's nothing out of the ordinary necessarily there. But, all right, Tuesday we're doing this. Wednesday's a day game. We drove up to Niagara Falls, the Canadian side, on Wednesday night, which I had never done in five years. Thursday we do wings. Friday we're doing Ted's Hot Dogs and Hamburgers, which is a mainstay in that region. Saturday we did Bar Bill. And Sunday, we are got a game and we're out. So, like, I also plan out the week to a certain extent so I know where we're headed. And if somebody says, oh, you have to try, all right, what are the hours? What's our schedule? So I, I, there's nothing that I haven't necessarily done yet. I mean, I'm, there are plenty of places I haven't gone to eat on these trips. But if somebody says it, I will find a way to work it in. Well, any good uh, broadcaster will tell you preparation is a key aspect of the job, and you bring that preparation into your your local travels as well uh, whenever you're on the road. So now people can check out a little more, at least, on Twitter, Twitter X, X Twitter. Uh, You're at... At A Marco underscore 16. At A Marco underscore 16. So I think that's a great resource for checking out the highlights of the, throughout the International League, and um, maybe that blog is still up there somewhere. I think it is. I actually look back for it every once in a mm-hmm. while. Uh, I blogged about the lengthy excursion, the day of the eclipse. Mm-hmm. We were down in, I don't know, Greenville, Columbia, somewhere, and we had a nightmare bus ride back, and I often want to reference that, and I'm pretty sure that was like the last blog post I wrote. Yeah, well, don't <laughs> let it disappear. <laughs> Blogging blogs are a key part of history, and uh, for now though, check it out on Twitter. I'm not even gonna say X again. Um, but thanks, Adam. That was great talking to you, and I think people are gonna have a lot of great recommendations from listening to this. I hope so, and thank you so much for coming out to PNC Field. It's great to have you here. It's great to be back here in Scranton, Wilkes-Barre. this podcast to bring you another thrilling edition of Ghosts of the Miners. Now, here's your correspondent and host, Joshua Jackson. Welcome back to Ghosts of the Miners, in which all of you out there in Radio Land must identify the legitimate 
Market Historical Ball Club hiding amidst the fraudulent pair. One wants wowed fans of all ages. The others never impressed or disappointed anybody at all. In the last segment, I asked you which of the following minor league baseball teams did at one time exist. A. The Canton Watchmakers. B. The New Bern Cuckoo Clocks. C. The Cairo Sundials. You know what time it is if you picked A. The Canton Watchmakers, who idled away the hours for a couple seasons in the Ohio-Pennsylvania League over 100 years ago. But who's measuring? Not quite 25 miles south-southeast of Akron, Canton is the seat of Stark County and is a stark contrast to towns that didn't have any watch factories in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. After the Duber Watch Case Company bought the Hampton Watch Company in 1888 and built two enormous, nearly identical side-by-side -side factories in Canton, it was said that one out of every ten residents worked for one of the two concerns. Yes, they were all Canton watchmakers. But our Canton Watchmakers debuted in 1908, taking the place of a team in the Central League and picking up a tradition of pro baseball in President McKinley's favorite town that dated to 1885 and included two 1890s clubs named after the Duber Watch Case Co. as the Canton Dubers. But whatever the mechanics of the past, in 08 it was time for a new face of the miners in Canton. And when the Watchmakers took the field, Cantonites shouted, this is our team. <laughs> Although the aptly named Akron Champs took the Ohio-Pennsylvania League title in that first year for the Watchmakers, Canton can't have been far behind, and it wasn't. Fans watched the Watchmakers go 65-54 and 54 for a third-place finish, with the timekeeping club getting a big hand from Bill Harry Bailey, who led the loop with eight homers. In 09, the rest of the league turned back the clock, or turned back the Watchmakers anyway. Had everything run like a finely crafted machine for the Watchmakers, the third place finish would have had our Canton Club progressing to seconds. <laughs> but not only those champs of Akron, but the East Liverpool Potters, the McKees Port Tubers, and the Newcastle Knox drove the Watchmakers cuckoo relentlessly tapping out wins until Canton was 55 and 67, 26 and a half games behind the champion champs. Aww. But time marches on and things change. Canton's club in 19 and 10 saw Irvin Kaiser Wilhelm lead the league with 23 wins and 284 strikeouts. But darn those champs how they grinded Canton's gears. The squad finished only second with a 72-54 and 54 record, a single game behind Akron. What's more, they did it with a new and old name, the Canton Dubers. And that's how Canton ticked off the Watchmakers moniker. Now on to the question for next time. Which of these teams had the energy to bear a heavy load in the minors of yesteryear? A. The Brewster Cinder Blocks. B. The Sugar City Anvils. C. The Coffeeville Bricks. Want to know the answer? Pep up and go. Or tune into the next Ghost of the Miners. But for now, you'll have to excuse me. My producer Ben Hill is making waffles, and his syrup will not be contained. <laughs> Wrapping up this week's episode of the show before the show podcast, MILB.com, where you can still find uh, all of the best in uh, our promo news and uh, other fun on field slash off field stuff. Um, and MILB.tv, of course, is where you can check out all the top talent in minor league baseball. Uh, ben, promos to watch this week. What's your favorite one? What do you got? Yeah, this is one we talked about, I know, in past episodes, but now it's happening Friday, today. For those listening to this podcast on the day it's released today, August 18th, a Friday, the Akron Rubber Ducks will be playing as the Sauerkraut Balls. And that is just like with the JoJo's 
the Akron JoJo's, a potato side dish. Sauerkraut balls is another Akron alternate identity that I'd never heard of in any way, shape, or form before the alternate identity was released. So that's my favorite thing about any alternate identity that makes you go, huh, what? And then learn a little bit. And uh, sauerkraut balls are a uh, Northeast Ohio Akron area specialty. The team announced this alternate identity on New Year's Day because it's apparently um, something that you might eat on New Year's Day, a uh, tradition around those parts. And they are, I think, what you'd expect a sauerkraut ball to be, you know, a deep fried kind of dough ball stuffed with sauerkraut. And um, honestly, it sounds amazing. I would crush that. I'm yeah, a I'm a sauerkraut fan. Yes, I'm sure they'll be at the ballpark. And uh, if you ever go to Akron, be on the lookout for places that have JoJo's and sauerkraut balls and uh, who knows what else uh, regional specialties they have out there. But that'll be at Canal Park today, Friday, August 18th. I remember we talked about this at the time when we talked about uh, the sauerkraut balls. Is there like a dipping sauce of choice with a sauerkraut ball? Yeah, yeah. And I think the team was kind of trying to stipulate like what – what you know what what the different options were but i believe marinara marinara oh is, interesting is the go to but i think with something like that you know a a dough ball with sauerkraut you could think you could think about all sorts of different dipping sauces that might work with that i could see you know like a ranch style or blue cheese style working maybe a thousand island I know that uh, Northeast Ohio is real big in the mustard, and people have strong opinions say, about mustard. You could probably I'd go dip with some... like a, a spicy brown beer mustard. That's what I yes. do. So that would definitely be an option, and I don't think you'd be um, you know shamed for that. I think you'd be celebrated, but I can't speak for the people of Northeast Ohio. <laughs> um. All right, on the dot TV side, Sam, what are you watching this week? Yeah. So this week, I'll be keeping an eye on Louisville against Iowa. Uh, particularly on Saturday. Saturday will be our free game of the day, so you'll be able to watch that one for free on MLB TV, uh, MLB.com slash pipeline, MLB.com, multiple ways to watch that one for free. You don't need uh, a subscription to watch that one Saturday. But that's a fun matchup, not just because it's two NL Central affiliates going up against each other, Louisville Reds affiliate, Iowa Cubs affiliate. But there are some really good prospects in that game. Pete Crow Armstrong is going to be the standout. He's our number 12 overall prospect right now in the top 100. Connor Phillips is expected to start that day for Louisville. He's actually led the minor leagues in strikeouts for much of the season, been up top uh, at or near the leaderboard for pretty much all summer. Uh, looking at his stuff, his fastball has been averaging 96 miles an hour. He's got a slider in the mid 80s that has been helping him get whiffs. So him going against Pico Armstrong should be pretty special. And then of course the bats also have Noel V. Marte, uh, the, the latest Reds infielder who's knocking on the door of Cincinnati. It seems like they don't have enough of them. Guys playing mostly third base these days, but when he makes contact, it can go a long way, and he can certainly uh, show off his own power on Thursday or on Saturday uh, during that free game of the day. So tune in for that one, Louisville against Iowa. Tyler, what are you watching? Well, I was very excited uh, to pick a game for Thursday uh, on this week's episode of the show before the show. But then Sam told me that we're still releasing this episode on Friday. So that would have been kind of dumb. So I was going to tell you about top Toronto Blue Jays prospect, Ricky Tiedemann, who I know has not had a ton of work this year. He's been dealing with some biceps issues, uh, but looks as though he is, uh, is ready to roll and is healthy with double a New Hampshire. Um, I instead am not going to tell you about Ricky Tiedemann and that start, but by the time you hear this on Friday, According to the schedule, he will have already pitched on Thursday, so let us know how it went. Uh, but I am going to stick in that same series because uh, New Hampshire is visiting Hartford. Um, and when I was talking with Jeff Dooley last week, uh, the Hartford Yard Ghost radio broadcaster, um, and told me about a bunch of the, the prospects that they really like in Hartford so far this year. Uh, and one guy who is, I mean, essentially fresh off of his draft year uh, is Jordan Beck, who was a competitive balance round pick last year and is now the number 88 prospect in baseball. Um, went to the Rockies out of the University of Tennessee, uh, hit 15 homers as a sophomore there. He's got some uh, really impressive across the board grades uh, from his skill set. He's uh, scuffled a little bit of double A after making the jump from high A, but he crushed things in the Northwest League with Spokane. He had 292, 378, 566 in 76 games with Spokane. 
Hartford, the OPS is still decent at 780 um, and starting to get his legs under himself there. Uh, and you can catch Jordan Beck and the Hartford Yard Goats as they take on the New Hampshire Fisher Cats uh, with some very good Blue Jays talent on uh, on this weekend series. And, uh, you know, if you did happen to have the prescient sense to check out Ricky Tiedemann on Thursday, good for you. It's also a doubleheader on Thursday as well and uh, features a weird thing in that New Hampshire will be the home team for the second game because it's a makeup of a rained out game uh, from late July in New Hampshire. So they get to be the home team on the road in Hartford. And uh, that'll do it. For this week's episode of the show before the show, you can get in touch with us, podcast at MILB.com. Uh, send us your questions, your thoughts, your comments, your concerns as we head toward the final month and a half of minor league baseball's regular season and postseason. And uh, for Benjamin Hill and Sam Dykstra, my name is Tyler Mon. We'll catch you next week. 